Hello, everyone, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Mark Ellis, and this is the daily show where we bring you all the latest in the world of movies, plus a little bit of insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is Collider's John Campia. Well done, Mark. Well Thank done. You. That was You nailed that intro. Feels well pretty good. Uh, hey, for some of you may be wondering, where is Sinead? Where is Ashley? Well, today, we talked about it on yesterday is the Pretty Little Liars Marathon and ABC Family. And Ashley and Sinead are actually like hosting the marathon throughout the day on ABC. It's amazing. So they said, hey, do you think we can just stay home and watch this? I was like, yes, stay home and watch that. We got to cover what can go wrong with the three of us. <laughs> what a great excuse to ditch work. <laughs> also joining us is co the host of Collider's Jedi Council, Christian Harloff. Ashley, you look terrible this morning. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute, wait a way. minute. Today I noticed something different about the hair. <laughs> today I today, noticed something today. different about the hair. Thank you, guys. And by the way, I'm Mark Ellis, and uh, I'm also on this show. <laughs> Perfect. All right, what do we got? We're in trouble. <laughs> this is, this is going to be a mess. All right, start us off. According to Deadline, plans are now moving forward for the upcoming feature, The Devil in the White City, which will star Leonardo DiCaprio and will be directed by Martin Scorsese. The film is based on the 2003 novel of the same name and is described like this. Their fates were linked by the magical Chicago World's Fair of 1893, nicknamed the White City for its majestic beauty. Architect Daniel Burnham built it. Serial killer Dr. H.H. H. Holmes used it to lure victims to his World's Fair hotel designed for murder. Both <laughs> men left behind a powerful legacy, one of brilliance and energy, the other of sorrow and darkness. The film will mark the sixth collaboration between DiCaprio and Scorsese. Christian. What do you think of the sounds of the devil in the white city? You had me at DiCaprio and Scorsese. I mean, <laughs> I, I, yeah, anything these guys do, I want to see it. And this particular story sounds interesting. And I like that it's, they always switch it up. And I like when Scorsese jumps back into time. Uh, he, <laughs> you know that he's going to capture the era. He, he always does. He's one of the most brilliant filmmakers that we've ever seen. And DiCaprio right now is his muse. You know, he's his new De Niro. And they work really well together with The Wolf of Wall Street. Still, it's, I would say it's one of my favorite movies of all time at this point. I love that movie. I love what they did together. And that was in the 80s. And nice now to go back here and to link up these two guys. I, I'm wondering which one DiCaprio is going to play. You would assume the guy who builds it. He's uh, playing the murderer. Oh, he's playing the he's murderer. Playing, yeah, he's playing the murderer. Is that? Is, yes. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. That's uh. And who's and do we know so yet? So he's like the Bill the Butcher. Yeah. In this one. So <laughs> now, it's now even more so because it's this is this proves again not only what filmmaker Scorsese is, but what an actor DiCaprio is has yeah. been coming off. We don't know what to the extent of what his role is going to be in the Revenant. Um, he's obviously the protagonist in that one. Yeah. But it'd be nice to see him finally, not finally, but to play an antagonist and to go dark. You know, we can do it. We've seen him do it in, in Django. We've seen him do it in some other movies. So, yeah, yeah, this is, this is going to be highly anticipated for me once it starts going. What makes this a better potential than Django is that in Django, yeah, he played the bad guy. And we haven't really seen him play the bad guy much at all. And that was really cool to see. But it was it was a very cool bad guy it was a very it had elements of comedy to him being a bad guy this is straight up i'm a butcher <laughs> i'm a dude who lures people into right. these places and i murder them that is a different level that's something we haven't really seen him kind of play yet look we are at a point now where there's just no getting around it if you're going to have a conversation about the greatest actors working in the business today you have to have leonardo dicaprio in that conversation where you put him is totally up to you but he's got to be in that conversation the fact that he scorsese just is so comfortable with him and keeps wanting to go back to him that just speaks volume now i'm very curious to find out who they cast in the other role because if they get not that the specific name, but if they get a Tom Hardy, mm -hmm. for instance, a Tom Hanks, uh, hey, maybe we see a Gangs of New York reunion. We see Daniel Day Lewis back in there. This suddenly becomes one of my most anticipated films of the next couple of years. Batman 
Star Wars notwithstanding. <laughs> I mean, this is going to shoot right up there. So to me, this is fantastic. Yeah, and the fact that Scorsese is doing it and he's stepping out of his comfort zone a little bit because he's doing Chicago as opposed to New York. Right. I mean, we saw how he, he's crushed a New York number of times, and then he was doing Boston in The Departed. So to see him do Chicago like this, where it's going to have sort of a mobby kind of feel to it with this evil dude that Leonardo DiCaprio is playing. And you look at the time period. It's in 1893 is when this action takes place, which is just a couple decades before Titanic and Great Gatsby, which are two roles that he really sunk his teeth into. So it's the perfect period piece for DiCaprio and the perfect directing challenge for uh, Martin Scorsese to keep him interested. I can't wait to see what he does with that town in that era. You know what's funny is one of my favorite quotes from DiCaprio about Scorsese from The Wolf of Wall Street was like, he's, how old is Scorsese now? 75 or something? So yeah, he's, so he's, he's in his he's, 70s and he said, and he's still making punk rock. Like and that was <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite quotes, quote. and it this it it just shows you. You watch his films, you don't feel like it's someone who's lost touch. You feel like they are, even and, and in this era, it's gonna still feel like this is modern filmmaking, but with you know with that genius touch on it. And my he, my favorite yeah. my favorite Martin Scorsese story. I gotta share this one. Is first of all, I don't like to fly. I do fly because I have to fly. I don't like to fly. Dennis doesn't like to fly either, <laughs> and we get this call. And they want us to fly to New York, Dennis and I to fly to New York, to meet with and interview Martin Scorsese for, which anniversary was it for Taxi Driver? Driver. Yeah, but it was like the 25th anniversary or the 30th anniversary. One, one of those things for this, this anniversary of Taxi Driver, right? And it's like, man, I don't know. I want to fly all the way. Even though it's Martin Scorsese, do I want to fly all the way to New York for a five-hour flight to talk to one guy? Yeah, it's Martin Scorsese. So, <laughs> so Dennis and I, off we go to the airport. We fly to New York. It was not a pleasant flight <laughs> to start with. So we land in New York. I'm already in a bad mood. And as soon as we get to New York, I turn on my phone. It's like, oh, this thing came up and Martin's not available. Oh. <laughs> and me and Dennis were like looking at each other. You've got to effing be kidding me. Oh, man. So we still stuck around. We got to go to the Q&A. We got to go to the, the special anniversary screen of Taxi Driver. A lot of people there. We got to meet and interview actually a lot of very cool people who were there. We didn't realize we were going to be there. And we got to see Martin Scorsese, and it was all very cool. But yeah, that that was all. <laughs> we oh man! Fly. It's like what? What? Glad you didn't heckle him with your plane ticket. Like Scorsese, <laughs> right. I flew five <laughs> hours for you. <laughs> The new film, The Man from U.N.C.L.E., opens in theaters this week. The film stars Man of Steel, Henry Cavill, and the social network's Army Hammer. All of us at this table have actually seen the film, and we wanted to give you our little review of the movie. So, John, let's start with you. Your thoughts on The Man from U.N.C.L.E.? I didn't know what to expect going in. Because, look, first of all, I am a, a big fan of Henry Cavill. I love what he's done. I, I loved what he did in The Tudors. I thought he was really strong in that. I thought he did as much as a lead actor could do to salvage immortals. Uh, and I, I love him as Man of Steel. I, I love him as Superman. I think he's great. I also really like Army Hammer, notwithstanding the Lone Ranger and stuff like that. And here's for some of you who may forget, I remember sitting there watching that scene that's in the trailer where Cavill and and uh, Hammer are fighting in that in the bathroom stall. Right? It's like a lot of people forget George Miller's. Uh, Justice League movie that George Miller was working on about seven years ago yeah. now, six, seven years ago, that never came to fruition, but it was like weeks away from starting shooting. You know how they, they had cast as Batman? Army Hammer. So we were getting an early glimpse of Batman versus Superman. And Cavill was such a <laughs> Superman back then, too. I, I think I know Cavill, Cavill was being was looked at. Did he actually? I don't think did, Cavill was rumored to be Superman also because Cavill was supposed to be Superman in Brian Singer's version. Yes, and then I think that he was also supposed to play Superman. And in he that was version. supposed to be James Bond before they gave it to Daniel Craig. And right. It's like he's a right. lot of almost in his right. career. But I didn't know what to, to think going into it. I gotta tell you, me personally, I adored this film. I it reminded me a lot of the the spy kind of comedies that we used to get around the late eighties, early nineties era. I thought it had a lot of charm. I thought the characters were really good. I thought Army Hammer, once he starts speaking in his Russian accent, was totally gonna lose me. But you know what? It didn't. I actually got really into it. And the chemistry between the two, by the end of this film, I was like. I am totally ready for a sequel for this movie. I want to see these guys on screen together again. It probably won't happen because this movie's going to bomb, but <laughs> I really personally, I really like this movie, and I hope you give it a chance. I, I think I probably liked it the most at this table. I don't know, Chris, you saw it. Your thoughts on it. I enjoyed it as well, too, and I, and I have to give um, props to Guy Ritchie because, it, it look, here's one of the reasons, too, and I'm not going to kid myself. One of the reasons I think I enjoy this movie maybe more than I should is that I had just seen 
seen Fantastic Four two hours beforehand. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because the movie wasn't, and I had said this in our review, is that Fantastic Four wasn't fun. You cannot deny, even if you didn't like this movie, this movie is fun. They have fun with this movie for sure. Um, it's a bit campy. It's a bit cheesy at times, too. It, there's never really any stakes because you know it's all that. It, it, it almost feels like an Austin Powers movie at, at times, which is I, I, was, I was okay with. I don't really, not as a person, I don't know the man, but as far as an actor goes, I'm not a fan of Army Hammer at all. I think that the studio has been, has been pushing him for years to be this star. He's never had the star quality. He, he's, he was good in the social networks, whatever. Everyone always brings up. Um, he was he, also really good in that Clint Eastwood movie that wasn't a good movie, the one with Leonardo one? DiCaprio. Oh, Jay oh, Edgar. Jay Edgar. Yeah, yeah, yeah but I he was, he was wearing was the good. Six Flags old yes, man makeup yes, the was, whole time. But that's so, not his fault. Uh, but, no, it's not his fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, but, but uh, no, he, uh, he, but in this movie, he's fine. I thought I, I, his accent wasn't great, but it didn't take me out of the movie. But Alicia Vikander, if that's how you pronounce her name, I'm in love with her. Oh, yeah. She's so. Yeah. Good. She is so good. She is. She just. She's. And I didn't like her at first. No, but just the but, acting. She, her eyes. It's like great acting always comes with the eyes, and she's just so. She's going to be around for a very long time. I think that it was her and Cavill replacing Tom Cruise. I believe in this in this role as well too. Yeah. Um, Cavill s stepped up, showed a different range from himself. Actually, got to talk a lot more, Mark, than he did in. in he had lines, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I think that they're the stand the standouts in this, as well as Guy Ritchie. Uh, it's you know it's it's a fun movie. It's a fun movie, and I enjoyed it for what it was. You know, you guys were throwing around the L word. As my girlfriend can attest, I don't say love that often. Alicia Vikander, I'm definitely infatuated with Henry Cavill and Army Hammer. I I I haven't seen enough of them to make me convinced that they're movie stars. But watching this film. They were the highlight to me. Their chemistry was so good as they're going back and forth and they don't really like each other, but they have to work together. That was the most intriguing part of the film. Guy Ritchie, I think eventually his style overtook the substance of the movie, and I thought that Hugh Grant was a little wasted in this. I wanted to see more of Hugh he Grant. Was. He yeah, seemed to yeah. have such fun when he was on screen. I wanted more of that, and it, it just I think the film wore out its welcome a little bit, but I was having a good time, and I think that if you go to the movie to see it, I hope it doesn't bomb, John, because I think <laughs> it at least is, is worth checking out if if you're interested in a spy movie, and we talk about the year of spy movies potentially, starting off with Kingsman, okay? And then you have something like this. You have Spectre. You have Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. If you're a spy, it's a good time to be at work. Yeah, so, I mean, out of 10 for me, I'm going to end up, I'm going to give this one a 7.5 for me. What would you give it? Uh, see, we don't, we don't, I push. I'll go 7.5. Yeah. All right, yeah. Mark? Uh, I'll go like 6.8. <laughs> that, that's nice a fair you know what, one number. of the other things I really liked about you, that I just thought about is I love it would have been interesting to see how this movie played out had Tom Cruise actually played Ilya in it because it would have been different because there are these scenes in it without giving any spars away where Henry Cavill keeps referring to him as it because you, <laughs> if you saw the Entourage movie you do get the understanding Army Hammer is a massive human being he is a big dude and I just I started to really get into this thing of when his hand starts twitching like I just really got the sense of some terrible terrible things are about to happen right. like because he's got such a temper I, I really like the way they played that so 6.8 7.5 7.5 5. <laughs> go see um, the man from uncle it's it's really quite good I hope you'll enjoy it all right folks we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell here's how this works in front of him Mark's got a number of other issues in the world of movie news. He's going to run them down. Then those at the table, including him, are going to buy it or sell it. So, Mark, what do we got? I thought you were just going to say Mark has a lot of issues, and <laughs> indeed that is the case. As many of you know, Dwayne The Rock Johnson is going to be starring in an R-rated Baywatch movie that the star has confirmed will be a raunchy comedy. And now The Hollywood Reporter is claiming they've found his co-star. According to the report, neighbor star Zac Efron will appear alongside The Rock in the film. Mark... Buy or sell Zac Efron <laughs> joining Baywatch. Thanks, Mark. You know, I do like this play a lot because Zac Efron impressed me in Neighbors, and he's not playing a DJ in this one. So, of course, uh. I'm going to want to check out this new Baywatch. Think about what the history of Baywatch has been. It's been about really gorgeous women and hard bodies on the beach. Zac Efron has the best abs in the business right now. Well, maybe The Rock might have something to say about this. But those two guys sparring, going back and forth, having a fun chemistry, I hope is what we get from this movie. And then, of course, let's start casting the females on the beach. That's going to be a little important as well. Christian? Uh, I buy it, and I buy it because... These are the comedies I want to see Efron doing. You're right. He was great in Neighbors. He has he, the guy. 
is a good actor. He just it's just some of these choices when he's doing the DJ movie and the Nicholas Sparks movie. <laughs> Stop it. Who is his agent? Come on, man. He's <laughs> here, you're, you're picking the right R-rated comedies, I think, because putting him up against The Rock is a smart move. That's going to work. We all bought the Baywatch thing last time. Mm -hmm. We all talked about it. It could really be a very funny 21 Jump Street like version of Baywatch. Very smart. Could definitely see him being uh, next to The Rock and really killing this thing. Now, the next role, when you do your drama, don't go after the f f f f f go after something that's good. <laughs> is that your DJ? <laughs> <laughs> that was a, wow. I was, I didn't, wasn't sure what you were talking about. It doesn't matter. <laughs> what, what matters <laughs> is that this kid needs to start doing real drama, be in real movies, and show what he can do instead of doing this nonsense. But this particular story, I think he's perfect for it. I think that it, it's, it, this is what I want to see him do, and I want to see him be outrageous again because even that stupid movie that he was in with uh, Miles Teller and um, that awkward moment yeah, yeah he was good in that I movie I thought he was quite good yeah. in that movie that, actually, it yeah. wasn't stupid I it's liked not that the movie. best movie but he's but he's really good in those roles he so. can carry those he yeah he showed in that movie he can carry those types of like a little more a little more dramatic romantic comedy yeah. he can carry those things you know I would have sold this story because I want to see him doing more drama. We saw in films like Paperboy. We saw in films like, you know, uh, uh, me and Orson uh, Welles. Orson Welles. Mm -hmm. You know, if films like that. This dude has got dramatic acting chops. Why he got involved in this DJ movie, I have no mm -hmm. idea. But I did see Neighbors, and it's like, this dude has comedic chops. Playing off the right, and and that's the key for these types of comedies. It's the chemistry between the players. Does this guy really play well off against this guy? Zac Efron playing against. Um, uh, Seth Rogen in Neighbors was a brilliant pairing. It really worked well. So because I saw him pull off chops like that, because I actually liked him in that awkward moment, seeing him in something like this with The Rock, this could be really, really quite cool. And, and I don't want to rain on the parade that we're having on the beach right now, but the one concern I do have is that neither one of these guys come from a comedic acting background. Yes, he was great in Neighbors, and The Rock has charisma for days, but who are you going to cast this movie to actually be the the kind of wacky, the funny person on the beach? Now, look, there's a lot of roles you could cast in Baywatch. You could have a schlubby lifeguard, but these two guys don't necessarily come from that world, so I'm interested to see how they do together. Oh, you know who you got to put in this movie? You got to put T.J. Miller in this movie. I yes. think T.J. Miller against these two guys would be great. And you got to get Kristen Wiig in this movie. I think Kristen Wiig would be hilarious. Yeah. See, you got to go the other side on that. I think that, I think that you're, you're getting too silly and too goofy if you throw those guys in there. I like both of them. I like Kristen Wiig and T.J. Miller, but I like that. I, I disagree. I think The Rock has amazing comedy chops. I think we've seen it before in Saturday Night Live. We saw it in, in the other guys, when he, the brief thing that he's right. been in. Um, his comedy, he's, The Rock has amazing co uh, comedic timing. And we know that Zac Efron, not the ultimate star as far as being he but he held his own against Seth Rogen so sure. I don't I don't necessarily as long as they can hit the comedic beats I don't need there to, to be that top comedian because I think that'll detract that'll take away from what we're trying to do here because even Ch Channing Tatum and Jonah Hill we didn't know exactly even though Jonah Hill he guess, comes from a comedic jo background, Jonah Hill yeah. does so I guess but but Channing Tatum really shined <laughs> um, in that in that role, so I I don't know I I, I don't necessarily want to say a big huge comedy star in a main role. I don't mind in like a little small role here and there, just just pepper it in there. But I want to see what these guys can do comedically. All right, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> a new official poster for the upcoming Quentin Tarantino film, The Hateful Eight, has debuted online. The film stars Samuel L. Jackson, Kurt Russell, Jennifer Jason Lee, Walter Goggins, Damian Beecher. Bashir. Tim Roth, Bashir, Tim Roth, Michael Madsen, and Bruce Dern. The Hateful Eight opens in limited release on Christmas Day with a wider release in January. Christian, buy or sell this new poster for The Hateful Eight. Buy it. Come on, man. Bring me this movie already. This is perfect. It's <laughs> simple. Uh, and, it is, and you got... What you got Kurt Russell again looking straight out of Tombstone, man. Uh, he, <laughs> oh, you had to go there. He looks straight out of Tombstone. Look at him. Um, <laughs> make that meme. Somebody please make that meme today. Straight out of Tombstone. Doesn't he look like it looks like you go back to that movie? Yep. Um, I, yeah, th it's it's simple. It, it gives me everything the movie's going to be just from the two of them, him dragging her around on, on, with the handcuffs. I'm on board. I love the images. Yeah, I got to buy it, too. It passes my Michael Bay test, which is, you know, if you're watching a trailer or uh, I see a new poster and it's just because it's got somebody like Quentin Tarantino involved that you really like, if it said by Michael Bay, would you still like it? Yeah, I would still like that poster. If yeah. it said by Michael Bay, it's a great poster. <laughs> it captures what I think, you know, I say this a lot. In posters, does the poster to me capture in one frame a bit of the spirit of what this movie is? 
Look at that poster. It absolutely captures that. So I dig it. Everything I'm seeing coming out of this movie is just making me more and more excited for it. So for me, it's a buy. A huge buy for me. And speaking of stuff coming out about the movie, I was treated at Comic-Con to get to see six or seven minutes of footage from this movie. Wow. And from the footage I saw, it looks like the their backstory, Kurt Russell and Jennifer Jason Lees, is going to be the centerpiece of the movie. They're all going and they're all going to have this weird interaction in this small house with a bunch of other people, the Hateful Eight. But it looks like Kurt Russell and Jennifer Jason Lee are your star of stars of this movie so yeah that poster sells the film correctly to me it, i'm not buying a false uh you know bill of goods here that we get to see them be the marquee names on a movie that's packed with other stars very cool all right what's next well speaking of new posters the first official poster for the upcoming film burnt has hit the web the film stars four-time academy award nominee bradley cooper as chef adam jones who had it all and lost it. A two-star Michelin rock star with the bad habits to match, the former enfant terrible of the Paris restaurant scene did everything different every time out and only ever cared about the thrill of creating explosions of taste. To land his own kitchen and that third elusive Michelin star, he'll need the best of the best on his side, including the beautiful Helene, played by Sienna Miller. Mark, buyer sounds <laughs> this <is a> poster <laughs> for Burnt. Um, I was looking at the poster, and the first thing I thought was Chef, with John Favreau in it, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, there's just going to be another movie where, which I like, Chef, but it's like, let's just celebrate food. This looks like a really interesting story and a background, plus Bradley Cooper and Sienna Miller back on screen together. I thought they were really good in their scenes with fake babies in American Sniper, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to buy this poster. It looks like it's selling me the correct movie. Uh, I'm going to buy it as well. And if you know, I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the original title of this movie was also Chef. Uh, was actually also the title of this movie at one point. <laughs> so there you go with that. Yeah, look, I'm all about foodies. I, I mean, I love. It. I'm surprised there's not more films about it, considering what a big hit. Like you know, Iron Chef is, and you know, the Food Network. Now we got Food Network, the cooking show. There's multiple cooking shows and cooking channels now <laughs> with all this kind of stuff. I'm surprised we don't see more of this. Four times, four years in a row, Bradley Cooper's been nominated for uh, Best Actor at the Ooh. Academy Awards. I don't think he's about to hit five, but uh, who knows? Maybe we'll see. Uh, it's, it, I, I buy the poster, but what's funny is that when I saw the poster, I thought maybe that it was that Ray photoshopped it and took it from his his old TV show, Kitchen Confidential, where he played a chef. Right. Um, and it, he's going <laughs> back to play a chef again. He was good in the in the comedy version of it. So he's and the reason I bring that up is because he obviously he's the type of actor he always has been. A lot of research goes into his roles. He he commits 100%. He's already done the chef thing in, in a TV series before. So he's going into it with a lot of knowledge. He's not he's he's going he's he's going in as a seasoned chef. <laughs> he really is. He really is because like yeah, and now to play the dramatic role and to be partnered up with Sienna Miller, I think this could be something really I, I don't want to say challenging because, he, like I said, he's been there doing the chef again. But I, I'm curious to see what he does this time around as a chef. Yeah, and let's not forget, too, the other supporting cast in this film. You've got Academy Award nominee uh, Daniel Bruhl. Mm -hmm. And you got Emma Thompson, you got Uma Thurman. Yeah. This, this is a nice cast for something like this. This could be a really nice centerpiece for Bradley Cooper to shine. So, yeah, buy it. All right. You guys feel like talking Star Wars? Nah. Always. <laughs> As many of you know, the next three Star Wars films are Episode 7, Rogue One, and Episode 8 in 2017. Many rumors and reports have circulated about what the Star Wars anthology film in 2018 may be. We can now definitively tell you that the Star Wars anthology film in 2008 was going to be Boba Fett. Those with the Zith table have multiple sources completely independent from each other and reliable sources that verified the rumored Bounty Hunter movie was indeed going to go down. A Boba Fett movie was coming. Christian, your thoughts on the 2018 Star Wars movie having been penned in as Boba Fett's? It's, it's funny because for so long, people have been talking how the rumor is supposed to be they're going to do a standalone Boba Fett movie, they're going to do a standalone Han Solo movie, when the spin-off movies were just announced. So eventually we were going to hear about these two movies. We did hear about Han Solo. Uh, we were on Jedi Council yes. broadcasting when the story broke and you looked at your phone and went, whoa, this just came in. Now Which that is going to be the 2018 That's the movie that's now. coming yes. out right now in 2018. That was not the case originally from what we were hearing. We were hearing that because when they first announced that all these anthology films rather than they announced Gareth Edwards was going to be doing one that was coming out in 2016 before we knew what it was, before right. we knew Rogue One, while the speculation, we were wondering what it was going to be. And then they said Josh Trank was going to be doing the other one. That movie will be coming out in 2018. That was slated. So, and we're hearing it was supposed to be Boba Fett. That's what he was supposed to be doing from what, we're, what we have heard. Um, now, what I'm curious about, 
is now that they moved Han Solo into that spot, will we see Boba Fett now appear in the Han Solo movie? Because I had heard a long time ago that Simon Kinberg was very interested in the Bounty Hunter tales, uh, the, the old expanded universe novels that had come out, and him and Kasdan had been kind of working <clears> on it way before Trank was even involved. And so I want to see where that develops. I wouldn't be surprised, personally. This is nothing I heard. This is just my opinion. I wouldn't be surprised if Solo comes out first, then we get, I think, episode nine right after that, and then after that is actually Obi-Wan and not um, a Boba Fett movie. I think Boba Fett's going to be pushed to the side for a little bit, personally. Yeah, I mean, what's really interesting here is that there was some speculation that when it was announced that Lord and Miller were going to be helming the Han Solo standalone, a lot of people speculated that that was what was going to be Josh Trank's movie and that Lord and Miller... Uh, replaced him in that film after he stepped away and after he stepped off. That's not the case. It was right up until, and, and for shortly thereafter, Star Wars Celebration, which was not long ago, right up until Star Wars Celebration, and a short while after that, the 2018 anthology film, as far as Lucasfilm was concerned, everything, their plans, everything was in motion. They had already been working on it for over a year, was going to be Boba Fett. That was the movie they were going to do. I have no doubt that Han Solo was also on their roadmap, but that was probably going to be 2019, probably after uh, or 2020. I mean, who right. who knows how far off that whenever the next anthology film was going to be. Now, from what we understand, it doesn't sound that there was going to be any Han Solo in the Boba Fett movie, whether or not then they had any plans for Boba Fett to show up in the Han Solo movie. I'm not sure. I would be surprised if he did show up, considering I think they still have plans to do Boba Fett. Um, I think you might be right about the Obi-Wan coming first, but I'm not so sure about that because of the amount of work in there. But it is like just we have received multiple levels of, of confirmation on this that it was indeed uh, the one that was originally planned in 2018 was going to be Boba Fett. And... I, I got to tell you, I'm not losing any sleep over the fact that we're not getting a Boba Fett movie anytime soon. I'm still not thrilled that we're getting a Han Solo movie. You know, me personally, I want everything to happen. The, the Star Wars universe is big and grand and vast. Why do we continue to make it so small by just focusing on characters we've already know and we've already visited? I want to see them go a little bit further and move the story forward instead of looking backwards. That's just me. Now, I'm saying all that. And I'm going to be first in line when a Han Solo movie comes out. I will be first in line when a Boba Fett movie comes out. Of course I am. It's still Star Wars. It's just not what I would have hoped for. And, and I'm going to buy, I mean, you read the tea leaves and it says, yeah, I would buy the, the fact that a Boba Fett movie was coming out because it seemed like the smart marketing play to me. You're talking about how expansive the Star Wars universe is. The smart thing that they're doing is that Rogue One is the story that we're familiar with, stealing the Death Star plans. That's right. the first an anthology film. The next anthology film, taking a character that we know but is maybe the most mysterious guy that we know even all the stuff that we found out about him in the prequels, you don't know that much about Boba Fett. So using him as a link into another world in Star Wars is the smart way to go. Now, obviously, it's hard to miss with Han Solo if you get the casting right. So either way, like you guys, I'm going to be excited about these movies. Boba Fett was intriguing to me. I'm still not sold on whether I want to see an entire movie about Boba Fett because once he unmasks himself, and you get to see who he is a little and bit. the mystery's gone. I don't know that I want that. Having said that, he is a conduit to other stories you can tell that we have no idea anything that went down yet. Well, there's, an assault, there's, there's a bunch of different things that could happen to your point here. Like, what they could do, there's been a lot of rumors about the Netflix series, okay? Now, also remember that there were a lot of unfinished scripts, about 100 that are rumored, for that live-action series that was supposed to happen with Star Wars right. years ago. Do not be that Lucas himself was working Lucas, on. and a lot of it had to deal with the underworld and a lot of bounty hunters. It was Do, actually called Underworld, wasn't it? I think so. no, that was that was oh, no, the, uh, the, the thirteen thirteen was the video game, and then there was it was about it was about the underworld. I don't know what the actual title of the series was, but it was certainly about the underworld. Do not be surprised if elements of whatever this anthology movie maybe turns into a Netflix series. I wouldn't be and I wouldn't be shocked if Boba Fett showed up more on a Netflix series here and there. You still have that mystery. He's a cool character to follow throughout uh, a Netflix series. To your point as far as Han Solo goes being a movie that, you know, because I, I, I'm with you on Boba Fett. I don't necessarily want to see a full movie on him. I'd rather see him pop into a series because he's a character when he shows up, you're like, oh, wait a minute. Like just those scenes of Boba Fett were amazing. And then whoever your new character is. But Han Solo, remember, and I know, Mark, you like to say I'm the harbinger of death here, but I think Han Solo is not making it out of episode seven. You're an right. awful, <laughs> awful man. Certainly not out of eight. Um, <laughs> if he makes it out, if he makes it out of seven. But the reason I bring that up is once that standalone film comes, we're going to start missing Han. 
Um, so I think people who and you have to cast right. You don't cast right; it doesn't matter yeah. what you make. But I think that you're you'll change a little bit more about wanting the movie depending on where they where they put it in his history, what you might learn, what they might reference in seventh and eight, seven and eight. They're like, oh, that part of his, his history and what it played into. So you could do something interesting with him more so than I think Boba Fett. Well, getting back to the Boba Fett stuff on this, what Elsa's brings up to me is, does this, well, let me ask you guys this, does this, now that we know that that 2018 was definitively going to be the Boba Fett movie, and that's a fact, now that we know that, does that, lend any credence or does it subtract from these rumors we've heard oh, it's completely unsubstantiated but these rumors that we heard that in Rogue One uh, the actress leading Rogue One um, uh, uh, Felicity, Felicity Jones, Jones mm -hmm. that she could be her character could be the daughter of Boba Fett knowing now that that 2018 film was going to be Boba Fett do you think that lets credence that rumor or takes away from it? I think it still lends a little bit of credence because there's no rule that says you can't see Boba Fett show up in Rogue One like there, there's nothing saying that he's yeah. not going to be around there that he maybe helps the Rebellion steal the Death Star plants or even he's having a drink at the bar in the corner I think the same thing holds true for the Han Solo movie in 2018 I think you're definitely going to see Boba Fett in that movie in some capacity but you're right John I think they want to incorporate him in to their ongoing anthology films. It's just a matter of if they're going to do that. But Christian, you bring up a great point with the Netflix series too. Yeah, well, you, you know, you, as far as, we haven't talked about that rumor yet. We didn't bring it up on Jedi Council yeah. yet. I hate that rumor. Oh, I know you do. I hate that. <laughs> That's rumor. why I brought the question. I absolutely <laughs> do not want to see her be his daughter. It's just another one. Well, you talk about having to bring everything into it like so oh my goodness michael b jordan's gonna be lando's kid because he's black or this you know, it's like no people can be separate characters she doesn't if, if one thing if you want to tie it in and you want to make it if you want to make us seem like oh this all kind of ties in make her sabine from rebels it's a lot easier and it ties into the character arc as opposed to just making her boba fett's kid because then that means then in empire strikes back he had a kid he's a deadbeat dad he's just going off for for bounties not paying attention to his kid it's stupid hey look dude you're on the road a lot as a bounty hunter, okay? You have a lot of dalliances with a lot of women. I think Boba Fett is a deadbeat dad. I think he's like an NBA player. I think he's got at least 15, 20 kids out there. Maybe she's one of them. Not I that I want to see I was going to say it, like but. a stand-up comedian, but, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, that too. The other thing is, so you bring up the, the issue, and I'll, and I'll finish this off with this, you bring up the issue about like, you know, the mystery of Boba Fett, right? Mm -hmm. He he shows up randomly and you know bad stuff's about to happen. I don't know that I want to see a full movie or Boba Fett gets home, sits down, starts going through the bills, starts talking right. to Mrs. Fett about, you know, why, why what is this charge? for 27 credits. What's this about? I don't know that I want to see that yeah. and lose the mystery. But, but I think that the movie that they were going to do, though, is more of him in the gear. Because in, in yeah. the Bounty Hunter Tales, he's full gear, just kicking ass the whole entire time, taking bounties and going through that underworld. I, it, could, it could be really cool. It could be dark. But it's just, he doesn't need to have a kid. He doesn't need to have a kid. He's like he's he's working for because in the or comics bills. doesn't need bills. Yeah. Anyway, we'll talk. We're going to talk more about this on Jedi Council. <laughs> sure. on you can shut up, or I will freeze you in carbonite this yeah. weekend. <laughs> hey, listen, folks. Before we get on with the show, I want to remind you: there's a new horror film coming out on August 21st called Sinister Two. Now, recently, we were lucky enough to have the star of Sinister Two, Shannon Sosaman, come in with the director of the film. Kieran Foy to talk a little bit about uh, to talk a little bit about Sinister Two. Now we're going to have the full interview up on our YouTube channel, but we just want to share a little clip of the discussion we had with them. Check this out, Kevin, who's asking, was there any point in shooting the movie that you were genuinely creeped out? Did any part of the uh, film legitimately creep you out as you when, were shooting? When, when I got bitten by a brown recluse, that freaked me out. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was <laughs> I was bitten by a uh, by this spider that I'd never heard of. Um, and uh, it's necrosis, so it's like it's like a, a real life zombie virus that you know, um, <laughs> if it gets into your bloodstream or your or, or the bone, it uh, you c you can lose your leg. Oh, you know? oh wow! So um, yeah, so I was taken to hospital that night, and I you know I had no idea what it was. I just couldn't move my leg, and I was I was more kind of like I was more annoyed that I you know I was missing the final shot that we were shooting, um, and then when I got to the hospital, they said yeah, there's a brown recluse we need to hook you up to an IV drip. And, <laughs> what, I love, what I love about that story leg. is that because uh, Kieran's the t my favorite kind of director. He doesn't sit behind Video Village. Right. He's <laughs> there He's there with you and uh, it's just, it, it, it's a great feeling. But the first time he decides to sit <laughs> in his director's chair, yeah. that's when he got bit. Yeah. Oh no, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically that, that spider was sitting in the director's chair. He was directing the movie, but uh, I didn't see him. But coincidentally, it was the same day that we had that uh, 
a real wolf spider on set for that scene with Dylan. Oh, and the spider. right, where with the with the slingshot. Yeah, yeah, and that that's a big spider, and he had three wranglers, and he <laughs> was like the biggest diva on set because he had uh, <laughs> he came in this kind of box with all this kind of cotton wool and stuff inside, and they they can't force him out. He'll come out when he comes out. Right. So <laughs> I, like on a movie like this, you're against the clock the entire time, and. And you know you have thirty days to shoot it, and and uh, you're kind of watching your your watch and going, is he coming out? Is he coming out? <laughs> and you're like, you know, I mean, he's not coming out yet. You know? And uh, <laughs> you're just waiting and waiting and waiting, and then finally, you know, the kind of the, uh, <laughs> the diva uh, entrance, the diva <laughs> entrance, and just walks and does it. You, you finished and goes back into its thing. But uh, coincidentally, it was that night, and I assumed it was that spider that got out. That would be funny, but <laughs> it wasn't. Once again, guys, Sinister 2 opens in theaters everywhere on August 21st. All right, folks, now it's that time of week since it's Tuesday to talk about what's opening this week, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. There are two major films opening. We're going to talk about one of them right now, and that is Straight out of Compton. Mark, tell us about Straight Out of Compton. In 1988, a groundbreaking new group revolutionizes music and pop culture, changing and influencing hip hop forever. NWA's first studio album, Straight Out of Compton, stirs controversy with its brutally honest depiction of life in Southern Los Angeles. With guidance from veteran manager Jerry Heller, band members Ice Cube, O'Shea Jackson Jr., Dr. Dre, Corey Hawkins, Easy E, DJ Yella, and MC Ren navigate their way through the industry, acquiring fame, fortune, and a place in history. John, should people be looking forward to Straight Out of Compton? Yes, this is a movie you should be going out to see. Now we already did our review of it, so I'm not going to go into everything. I didn't. I, I thought the third act of the film was a mess, but. Who cares? The first two acts, I remember the first two acts of the film, which is the majority of this film, I remember sitting in my seat going, this might end up being one of the top five best movies of the year. Now, that falls apart for me personally in the third act, but overall, this is a really cool, if you're interested in like hip hop history or anything, or just a good driving human drama, that's this movie. And I think you will have a good time if you go to see it, and I'll forgive you if you fall asleep during the third act. But other than that, yeah, this is one you should go out to see. Absolutely. It's, this is an iconic group. This is a group that... I mean, just is responsible for the for what hip hop is today. As much the same way Run DMC is, and other other groups that paved the way, and you see why, and you see what they did, and it, it chronicles a lot of their life, pun intended, I guess. Um, and the movie, I, I, it, I didn't mind the third act as much as you did. I, it certainly had its problems for sure. Then the first hour is the strongest of it, but it's just the chemistry with all of these actors, and they really brought to life what that was like. I felt like I was there. I never, I mean, there were there were times I didn't even feel like I was watching a movie. I felt like, I mean, it was, I thought it was a really good biopic. So this is a movie, especially not like John said, not only if if you're interested in in what happened here, but in just real human stories, you should check it out. Yeah, this is a powerful movie that I definitely recommend going to see in theaters. The way the music hits your ears in that theater with that sound system is incredible. And it's you run the danger with a movie like this of just being like a VH1 behind the music. And mm, it turns yeah. into that a little bit, but it's still an education. At its worst, this movie paints a picture of what it was like in Los Angeles around this time, and it's the perfect time for this movie to be opening up. First of all, because you can look back a little more fondly than you could right then at the time, but it's also, there's still issues that this film deals with that are relevant today, such as something like police brutality, or even something that's less serious when you talk about rap artists and how competitive they are with each other. Right. If Drake and Meek Mill think they have nice diss tracks, go watch Ice Cube. It's one of the most powerful <laughs> oh, so scenes great. in the that movie. Great. And, uh, and I really enjoy this as somebody who didn't grow up with NWA NWA in my consciousness because right when I was just starting to learn that there was a world outside of Virginia and you see these <laughs> problems with the Rodney King riots in downtown Los Angeles and figuring out who Public Enemy was and who Dr. Dre was and Snoop Dogg, this is really a nice education. So I would definitely recommend seeing this. Yeah, and you know, one of the things about it too is one of my favorite scenes, probably my favorite scene in the movie, is probably going to end up being still one of my favorite scenes of any movie this year, which was the Detroit concert. That Detroit mm -hmm, concert yeah, mm -hmm. scene, man, I was in, you could just feel it in the theater too. Yeah. I mean, it was just, that's such a great scene. But you're right, when they start going back and forth with the feuding, that, that scene was actually pretty damn fun. Yeah, and when you, really when you see NWA on tour, that's what it was like when you were Boba Fett as a bounty hunter, <laughs> only from planet to planet. All right, folks, we reached that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Mark's got a question pulled out of the mailbag. So, Mark, what do we got? X Smith writes, hey, guys, big fan. And, Mark, you're a wonderful host. 
I was wondering <laughs> if there was any development or news on the Now You See Me sequel. I loved the first one and was excited when they announced a sequel to this amazing heist film. The only bit of news I know is that Daniel Radcliffe has joined the projects. But what do you guys know? Thanks, and may the force be with you. Um, I am fairly positive that they're done shooting it. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure it's in the can, directed by uh, John Chu, who brought to you such films as the upcoming Gem and the Holograms, and uh, uh, Never Say Never, the uh, the Justin, Justin Bieber oh, right. documentary. Right. Yes, let's not ah. forget that. And, of course, G.I. Joe 2, none of which really gives me a lot of enthusiasm or excitement yeah. uh, for this. And I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't really like the first film. I, I thought the first film was littered with problems. The addition of Daniel Radcliffe as Michael Caine's son, though, I have to admit, even as somebody who wasn't a fan of the first film, this has piqued my interest. So that's where it's at. I cannot remember the release date. I'll look that up here in just a second. But I'm pretty sure the film's completely done shooting. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's done as well, too. But I agree with the, it was the guy who sent the email. I agree with you, John. I didn't love the first movie, but Daniel Radcliffe joining, I, and especially the Harry Potter tie with the magic. Right. It's like, come on. So, yeah, I definitely want to see it. I think that it would be... Is Ruffalo coming back for this one, too? He's got to. I believe if, he is. Ruffalo has to come back, especially the way that that all turned out. I mean, the out. way that his story tied up, though, yeah. you think that it might that they might move on to other no, not, pastures. I don't want to spoil anything from the first movie, but it, it, does, it doesn't seem like that should be the case. The Punisher kills him. Yes. No, yeah. So. <laughs> and by the way, the film comes out on June 10th, so about a little under a year from now. 2016. Uh, 2016, okay. so a little from now. As far as whether... Mark is in this film or not. Yes, Mark Ruffalo is yeah, returning for the film. Okay. Good, good. Because, I mean, everybody had such great chemistry watching this movie, and that's what I liked about it. It wasn't a great film. I wasn't watching it and leaving the theater being like, I can't wait to see the next one. But it's fun. When you have a movie like this come out in summer amid all the huge blockbusters and giant comedies, I like having these movies that are smaller. They feel like a great cable watch. That's exactly what the first one was. It'll keep you entertained. I hope the same for the second one. All right, folks, that will do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing in theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com right now for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. We are audio only on podcasts as well. Just open up your favorite podcast device and look up Collider Video or Collider Podcast. You will find our podcast there. And most importantly, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Keep up to date on everything going on in the world over here at Collider Video. I want to thank the guy sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting to my right, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you online? I'll either Twitter or Instagram. Check me out at Christian Harloff. And make sure this Thursday we're going to be talking more about Boba Fett on yes, sir. Collider Jedi Council. And we're also going to preview what we think we're going to see at D23. We'll have our speculations on what we think is going to happen. Maybe a new trailer? <laughs> and, of course, our lovely host today, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, <laughs> where can people find you online? You can find me online at 5150 Ellis, Twitter and Instagram. And you can find me for eight hours a day watching the show Pretty Little Liars on ABC Family, where my two hosting comrades are going to be hosting the interstitials. Get ready for that. And, of course... Happy Tuesday, guys. <laughs> yes, ah. yes. And hey, Look guys, don't forget, too, to, you know, uh, our our uh, our compatriot here, Mr. John Schnepp, he's off in Australia right now screening his film, The Death of Superman Lives. But we did pre-record uh, Heroes, and it went three hours. <laughs> so what we've done is we have split that Heroes into wow. two episodes. Part one, it's going to be looking at superhero films yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So that's basically looking at the, the superhero films of the last year or two, then looking at the superhero films of this year, and then looking ahead to the superhero films of next year. So part one will go online here on Collider Video tomorrow. Yeah, three hours. Wow. I never <laughs> want to hear that Jedi Council went long. <laughs> we'll go online <laughs> tomorrow, and then part two will be put up on Wednesday. So uh, wait, what day is it today? Today is Tuesday. Go up today. Part one goes I up just today. Say happy Tuesday. The guys. second part goes up tomorrow. So keep your eyes open for that. Anyway, guys, you can follow me on the social media networks just on Facebook or on Twitter, just following me at John Campia. And don't forget, guys, Collider Video has an Instagram account. Make sure you go find us there. It's just at Collider Video and follow us there. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us for Collider Video. My name is John Campion. Until next time, bye bye.